Have you ever wondered why most cinema cameras use less pixels than a lot of photography cameras? And also why one of these two cameras is only using 12 megapixels? In this video, we're gonna take a deep dive into why more pixels isn't necessarily better and why 12 megapixels might be the way to go. Welcome back to our channel. I'm Cajun with the Creator's Cup, and we make videos about filmmaking, camera gear, and YouTube. So if that's your thing, we invite you to subscribe. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps us out. So now let's get into Cliff's comparison of Sony and Canon sensors. And fair warning, if you're a Canon ambassador or a fan of quality knives, <laughs> this video might upset you. In all seriousness, the type of camera you have, the brand of camera you have, most of the specs of the camera you have has very little to do with the quality of film that you make. This is just gonna show you some examples why more Ks is not necessarily more better. And more importantly, why more pixels is definitely not going to be better for the purposes of video and filmmaking. So in that intro, we made these little frames. So each one of these squares represents a pixel and each color is what they call a bare filter. And all that really does is that filters out that color of light to tell the camera sensor that there's more red, more green, or more blue. And bare filters actually are red, green, and blue. You get two greens because apparently our eyes are more sensitive to green. I'm not real sure what that's about. Maybe worth Googling or watching another YouTube video on. But at the end of the day, this is an example of how pixels work on a camera sensor. So this is meant to represent a 12 megapixel camera with a full frame sensor versus a 45 megapixel camera with a full frame sensor. This would be like Sony's pixels versus Canon's pixels. Now, generally you would think, okay, you get more detail because you get more pixels in the image, but less light is going to get in to the smaller pixel. Before we dive into this experiment, let's talk about why pixels in video does not matter as much as the number of pixels in photography. See, in photography, you take a photo, say with a 12 megapixel camera, which is what I believe my cell phone has, and if you're gonna blow that image up or if you wanna crop or zoom in after the fact, you're gonna be somewhat limited. It's gonna get blurry fast. I actually took a picture the other day with my a7 III of a bald eagle, but it was a long ways away and I tried to crop in and I believe the sensor's around 24, 25 megapixels on it. And that wasn't enough to really crop in and get a whole lot of detail. Had I had a 48 megapixel camera or a crazy 80 megapixel camera, I probably could have gotten a lot more detail in that photo. But the reality is with video, it's always gonna be played back at 720, 1080 HD, 4K, or in some cases, but very, very rarely, 8K. 4K is less than 12 megapixels. So if your camera has more pixels than that and you're using it for video, those pixels actually aren't used and can have some negative side effects because they're smaller. They can provide a little more detail and upscaling, but not that much. Now, if you're recording in 8K, you could always crop in later, kind of the way you would with a photo. And you could also play on larger screens. But the reality is most of us aren't gonna be recording in 8K. Most of us are gonna use 1080 or 4K, especially if you're doing wedding videography or if you're just shooting for YouTube. I mean, I know some YouTubers that still use 1080 in all of their videos. So let's talk about the boring details of pixels real quick. What are they? Pixels are the small dots on the sensor of your camera that receive light. That light travels into the pixel and there's a sensor that measures the amount of light that it receives. It is then converted, I believe, into electrons, which then is fed into a computer chip that reads out the amount of light. Less light is closer to black, more light is closer to white, somewhere in the middle is gray. Now naturally, the more pixels you have, the more detail you will have in an image like we just talked about. With video, it's the same thing, but most people are watching video at a maximum resolution of 4K. 
So any more detail that you get than that isn't necessarily going to be used. It really is an amazing thing that pixels work the way they do. The fact that your camera is able to capture 12 million pixels or 45 million pixels on the sensor. It is incredibly small. We're talking, I believe, 4.3 microns on the Canon and around 8.4 microns on a Sony. That is really, really small. And it is amazing that cameras are able to not only see that, not only make chips that small, but also be able to understand and compute all of that information. So just to put it in perspective for you, let's take these little squares, which we have other plans for, and show you how small that really is in the real world. Be right back. We came out here to this big open field to give you more of an idea of how big a pixel really is. We're gonna take these cards right here, lay them on the ground, and then we're gonna take that drone right there and fly up high enough to give a reference from those pixels to what a real camera sensor size would be. All right, that is a Sony pixel versus a Canon pixel or a 12 megapixel pixel versus a 45 megapixel pixel. Let's see what this looks like. So if you check this out, right now we are up 220 feet in the air. And if I draw a square in this field, that's gonna be the Sony A7S III or the Canon R5 sensor. The pixels are those tiny, tiny little dots just right out in front of us. I mean, you can hardly even see them and some of that's the black frame around them. It's really amazing that they can make sensors that small with pixels that are just almost invisible. It really is incredible when you can put it in that kind of scale using an example that shows how small pixels really are. I mean, they are tiny and it's amazing that we can do anything, much less all of the cool things we can do with our cameras today. So the next thing I wanna show you guys is why we made these in the intro and how we can do another real life example right here in the studio. So this rig is designed to show what a pixel looks like up close. It's definitely homemade. It's definitely not perfectly scientific, but I figured it would give a good visual representation of how pixels work. If we take the 45 megapixel pixels, there's a group of four here, and put it on this. Now, this is going to be an example of lower light. I have the aperture closed really tight and the shutter speed set really fast. So with low light, get one more for good measure. And then let's grab the Sony Pixel, or Pixels, there's four in here. That always confuses me. We'll lay these on here. This will be the same thing. There we go. And while we're at it, let's go ahead and grab examples of properly exposed pixels. Turn this up. It's so bright. One more. And then let's switch back to the 45 megapixel cluster. And one more. So if we take this and have two examples right here, let's do the properly exposed pixels first. So we're gonna go with our Sony A7S III. We're pretty sure they're gonna use a 12 megapixel or any other 12 megapixel full frame sensor. And we're gonna use our Canon R5, which has a 45 megapixel sensor, or again, any other sensor close to that, even a 48 megapixel. So with the 45 megapixel sensor, the pixels are roughly half the height and width of a 12 megapixel sensor. So with a 45 megapixel sensor, each pixel is around 4.3 microns. With a 12 megapixel sensor, each pixel is around 8.4 microns, give or take. Now that we have our two examples, let's go over what we're actually seeing. So if we look at this one, 
each dot or LED bulb in this case kind of represents a photon. Each photon coming in or the amount of light per square micrometer that's coming into the pixel, right? So that's what we're showing. And obviously a larger pixel is going to receive more photons per pixel. Now, the other thing you have to take into account as pixels do create noise, and that comes from the camera sensor generally reading those pixels. So we will say they're gonna create roughly four points of noise per pixel. Now this applies to both the smaller pixels in a 45 megapixel camera and the large pixels in a 12 megapixel camera. In both cases, the noise is gonna be the same amount. So it's gonna be about the same width. So a larger pixel is actually going to inherently have much less noise in ratio to the amount of light. And this is where you get the term signal to noise ratio, light being the signal and noise being the camera just creating junk because it's not perfect. So if we take these two pixel clusters and blow them up larger so that you can see several side by side at the same time, what you're gonna find is they look really even, especially considering it's just a photo of a light and that they're very similar. Now in the real world, there's going to be noise. So if we were to take this and allow the colors to blend the way they would as you zoomed further and further out, you actually end up with a kind of greenish gray in this instance with the way the lighting set. But that's unrealistic. You're actually gonna have a little noise. So let's put some noise in there. Now that we have the noise, let's go ahead and let that blend to the gray you really can't see much difference there. It seems basically the same. And even as you up the exposure to make it even brighter, it's barely there, but it's barely noticeable. Especially on the 12 megapixel, it's pretty much not there at all. The reality is either one of these will do just fine and maybe the 45 megapixel will give you a little more detail. So it might actually win in this case. Now let's look at the two sets of pixels in lower light. So now let's add noise to these. The noise is about the same. The noise doesn't go down in lower light. It actually stays exactly the same, but the amount of light goes down, which means that you have more noise in ratio to the amount of light that you're receiving. So if we take this and blend it to what it would actually be, again, kind of a greenish gray, we can see right away, especially as we zoom back, that there's a lot of noise on the 45 megapixel camera. And if we look at the 12 megapixel camera, there's definitely still some noise. It's not perfect, but it is much better. Now let's say we turned up the ISO on that camera, or if we turned up the exposure later, remember we're brightening not only the light, but we're also brightening up that noise or bringing up the exposure of the noise as well. So let's bring those up. And that's where you really start to notice the difference. Low light isn't everything, but it is really important in a lot of cases. If you're going to film a wedding or a YouTube video or a reception or any other client work, you may want to keep in mind that you may need low light. Some examples of you needing low light would be if you want to film slow motion, especially if it's not sunny and bright, because you're using a faster shutter speed. And a faster shutter speed means a lot less light is getting into the sensor. So in that case, the low light would be helpful. If you don't have a really fast lens or if your aperture is really tight because you wanna keep a lot in focus, you're not going to get as much light. So again, low light would be helpful. Obviously filming at night or filming a darkly lit reception would be an example of needing low light. It's not everything, but it is important in a lot of cases. And if video is your main thing and you're not as worried about photography, then you're going to want a camera that can handle low light more than you're gonna want a camera with more pixels. And that's not even taking in the next factors that we need to talk about, which is in-camera processing, autofocus, stabilization, and post-processing, hard drive space. All of those things that we tend to take for granted until we find ourselves running out of memory and our computers are always just freezing up. Premiere is terrible about that. When it comes to stabilization, autofocus, and temperature, more pixels means more processing power is allocated to reading and processing those pixels. So if you have a 45 megapixel camera, it is going to take a lot more processing power to process each individual pixel and to either bend them together or downsample them or whatever the process is than if it were just processing 12 megapixels. So this means your camera cannot use as much computer power to control its autofocus systems and as much to control its stabilization. 
and the computer processor running harder also means that it's going to drain more battery power and produce a lot more heat. As an owner of an A6300, I know that recording in 4K and overheating is a major issue that is really, really frustrating. And with my A7 III that I currently use for our YouTube videos, it shuts off at 30 minutes, I think because of some trade deal or something, which is also really frustrating, but at least I can turn it right back on again and I don't have to worry about it cooling down. The stabilization I'm not as worried about because I usually use a gimbal if I need stable footage. I never really liked the way cameras process stabilization. It always looks a little wobbly and not very pleasing to the eyes. So what does all of this mean for us and for you? Well, if you already have a camera that does what you need it to do, just keep using that camera. We're talking three, four, five thousand dollars for some of these new camera bodies. And most of us already have a camera if we're filming today and working today that does what we need it to. Make sure before you buy another camera body that you have the lenses you need, the lighting you need, stabilization, and probably more important than all of those, good audio. Those are the things you should focus on first before going out and buying another camera body. If you have all of those things and you wanna upgrade, stick with your brand. If you're a Canon user, get the R5 or whatever one it is you wanna get because it's probably a really great camera. I'm sure it's amazing. And the 8K is probably pretty cool too. But if you're a Sony user, it looks like they have a really good camera coming out and you should probably upgrade to that whenever you're ready and you actually need it. There's no reason to switch. It's just so much money. Plus you have to learn a new camera. And at the end of the day, we need to focus more on our skills and our abilities than on what gear we have. These are just tools in our kit, as you've heard a million other YouTubers say before. Learn how to use the tools you have and then eventually get better tools if you really need them. Thanks again, guys, for sticking out this whole video. And if this is something you enjoyed, I ask that you please give it a like and definitely subscribe to our channel. We will be having more videos a lot more often in the coming weeks. Things have clearly been kind of complicated here lately, but we are getting a lot of content coming out very soon. For example, we are about to do a review on this hundred-ish dollar bin box which seems to be a pretty great little video transmitter if you need a monitor for your camera. We did that video a while back about camera transmitters, and this is definitely a more affordable option. This seems to work pretty well, but we'll have the full review here in a few days. As far as the Sony and Canon dilemma, I would love to hear what you guys have to say about that in the comments below. Let us know what you currently use, if you use either one, if you're thinking about upgrading and why, and if this has swayed your opinion at all. Also, please fact check me because, hey, we're all here to learn. That's what this is all about. All right, guys, we'll see you in the next one. Thanks.